Yeah, so today I'm kind of talking about what um, researchers should know before they start to use generative AI. Um, and as Alex said, this is informal, so please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, I'm also covering topics at a pretty high level. Um, so if you have questions that are a little bit deeper, let me know. Um, we can dive in as well. But I also know it's a pretty, uh, pretty large audience, so there's going to be a lot of different experiences and perspectives uh, on this. So um, what I'm going to cover today kind of falls into four different categories. So first, I'm going to start with just some foundations of generative AI, um, laying the groundwork so we're all on kind of the same page. Then I'm gonna delve into some of the opportunities for generative AI in the research context, as well as some of the risks. And then I'm gonna finish off with a few best practices, including some policies, and then also just some advice from the field. Um, so to get started, um, I do wanna make sure that everyone kind of has that solid foundation. I suspect that there's uh, a few folks in the room who are using generative AI, um, in research already, um, probably using it on a day-to-day -day basis, while I also suspect there's people here who perhaps haven't touched generative AI yet. You know that it exists, you've seen it in headlines, but maybe you haven't used it um, at all, or maybe you haven't used it for your work. So um, just to get started, AI models or what we're talking about when I talk about generative AI are AI models that are trained to produce some sort of content, new content um, is often what we talk about. So this is content such as images, text, audio files, video, code, code documentation, all that kind of thing. And the most popular tools are things like ChatGPT, um, Genesis, which is Google's new release. Um, it used to be Bard, but now they've rebranded to Genesis, and Dolly3, which is um, another OpenAI text-to-image tool. And the real difference between generative AI and the AI that we've been talking about for over a decade now um, is that previous AI models were really good at recognizing patterns. They could make some predictions, but they weren't great at generating new things or novel things or coming up with kind of anything, um, anything which might appear to be made from scratch. And of course, there are many other types of uh, generative AI models out there. Um, I've linked to, uh, there's a nice Wikipedia section that outlines a whole bunch of different examples. So the reality is, is that generative AI isn't new. Um, what is new is the easy access to it and our ability to uh, get onto ChatGPT and have this really nice to use interface. Um, a really brief timeline is that generative AI, um, some of the critical technologies behind generative AI, like GANs or transformers, emerged um, in between 2014 and 2017. And then those LLMs, those, those super large language models um, like GPT and BERT, they started to be developed just prior to 2020. And then the really big change here um, and why generative AI became a household name and something that um, you know, you hear talked about on the bus on at Thanksgiving dinner, kind of all over the place, is that um, OpenAI released this easy to use interface to GPT through ChatGPT. Um, and that's where you can see this spike. This is the Google Trends for generative AI search on this huge spike that came at the end of 2022. And the reality is this is a really rapidly evolving space. It seems like every couple of weeks there's a new model, a new technology, a new um, a new company in this field. Um, so it's going to continue to change quite quickly. Um, so of course, anything I say today may not even be relevant a week from now. It's hard to know. Um, and I also link to another um, more complete timeline. There's a nice article on kind of some of those background technologies as well. So Often, I feel like the first kind of use that we have for generative AI is something fun, a little creative, uh, and usually it does not pertain to work. So something like using generative AI to um, draw a concept art piece of a supercomputer named Cedar, um, you can give it some constraints. I wanted it to draw something that was a little gritty, but also kind of fanciful, and you get these nice, nice images that come out of it, and it's kind of fun, and you can iterate and um, you know, it might be, it may be applicable to your everyday life, but at this point, it's not super applicable in a work context. 
So how do we take kind of going, how do we go from this context, it's fun, um, to something a little more research focused? So um, I really like this breakdown of how we can talk about generative AI in research and within the research context. Um, the first is kind of in the weeds. This is the bread and butter of computer scientists. And this is really about research in AI or LLMs. So this is where new architectures, new types of models, maybe alternatives to attention, which is one of those underlying um, um, underlying features of these generative AI models, but it's really about kind of building up models from scratch. Um, then there's also research about AI or LLMs. This is where we might be talking about the philosophy of um, the philosophy of AI, the philosophy of science, ethics of data collection, how LLMs might affect jobs, and also things like critical studies on whether we should be using these models um, in different applications throughout the world. And then the final kind of category is where we're using, we're doing research with AI or LLMs. So this is where AI is helping to assist us in our research rather than our research being about or in that space. So this is the application of these existing models to other research areas or using it to help with some of the research infrastructure that we might need. So writing code, summarizing papers, that kind of thing. And this is going to be the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's tons of really interesting research happening in the other two spaces, of course. Um, but I think but for, you know, the fact that we only have an hour, um, I'm, we're going to be focusing on research, uh, applying these already built models to, what we're, to different topics and different disciplines. So a couple of quick use cases um, where you might, you know, see an LLM, an LLM or generative AI actually helping us in a research context are things like being able to ask a uh, co-pilot inside of a Word document to put together an agenda for an upcoming meeting with a new research collaborator. Um, you can ask it to put some times in, you can give it context, and it's going to give you a nice document that then you can fill in and elaborate upon. Other examples are things like asking a tool like Gemini, to summarize an open research paper for you and provide some briefing notes. So with that, I kind of want to transition into opportunities, but I will pause for a sip of water and to ask if there's any questions amongst the crowd. I also see the chat's open. Ah, that's just Alex. Okay. Okay. So to transition from what generative AI is to how we can actually use it within the context of research. So I'll start by talking about some of the roles or personas that we can give generative AI in research without anthropomorphizing it too much. Um, but I think it's helpful to understand kind of these different these different roles that it can have. Um, but before I jump into roles, I do want to just point out um, this is a survey that was done by Nature in September of 2023. So it's six months old now. So it's probably a little out of date given how quickly the field is evolving. But um, when it surveyed uh, 1600 researchers asking how generative AI is being, how they're using generative AI, some of the responses that it got back was things like helping researchers are using it to help write manuscripts, to brainstorm research ideas, to write code, to write presentations. Um, so the reality is, is that there's quite a wide variety of use cases. Um, so I'm going to present a few of those as well as these these roles that I've been talking about. So I've identified five different roles. Um, the first is the role of a copy editor. So we can use generative AI to review our documents, perhaps uh, evaluate tone or style, um, pick out on autocorrect. Tools like Grammarly use generative AI in the background. So we can think about generative AI as a copy editor. You can also think about it as a ghost creator. This is one of uh, the roles or personas that I think gets talked about the most in um, media outlets. And that's because it's perhaps the most um, it's definitely giving the most license to generative AI to just kind of create something. And there's a lot of risks associated with using 
generative AI as a ghost creator. Um, we'll talk about those in a moment. We can also use generative AI as a research assistant so or an intern. So if there's jobs or tasks that you might have an RA or an intern do, um, we can think about how generative AI might be able to help fill in some of those gaps, particularly if it's a tedious or ta a boring task that a research assistant might not be as keen on doing. Um, so helping to free them up for more interesting um, tasks. My personal favorite is to use Gen AI as a sounding board. Um, so using it more as like a, you know, someone you might go and have a coffee with, throw some ideas by, have them critique your ideas and poke holes in it um, and give you some suggestions. And finally, um, using Gen AI as an educator. I don't mean this as having them having a generative AI present a lecture for you or even write a presentation. That would be ghostwriting, but more about explaining and helping you understand a particular concept or topic a little more fully. So if we take these roles, we can actually start to apply them to different stages of the research process and start to think about how generative AI could be useful for particular tasks. So an example is thinking about literature review um, and how you might be able to use a generative AI in the context or role of a research assistant. So there are search engines that are you know, starting to incorporate generate, generative AI um, innately. So things doing things like triaging sources or papers or articles for you to inspect and read later on, or helping to orient a new researcher to the landscape um, that they're that they're entering or that they're interested in. You can also use um, tools like uh, generative AI to as in the educator role to help explain jargon, um, to help explain concepts, uh, to help kind of dive in and ask specific questions um, and understand what might be within a paper and give some of that additional context. Again, I think where we end up talking about generative AI the most when it comes to research is in the um, don't or in the kind of task of writing, which we often think about it as a ghost creator. So writing drafts from scratch, generating titles or abstracts based off of the paper that you've already written. Um, but I actually think where we tend to overlook or we have in the past overlooked the power of generative AI is in using it as a sounding board in the writing process. So writing a paragraph or writing a section of the paper um, and then using a generative AI tool to help summarize it back to you. Understand if you truly got a, across the message, the knowledge that you were trying to um, in that body of text. Having it raise questions, concerns, um, or perhaps highlight missing information or incomplete logic within, within a um, passage of text, as well as reviewing style. Um, this has come up, or I've, I haven't seen it in practice yet, but the we, there's been a lot of talk about when you have a collaboration um, where you have multiple people writing a manuscript, having a generative AI actually review it to try and see, have a single voice throughout the paper can be a helpful way to make it a little more cohesive. And then the final kind of opportunity that I'm going to just mentioned briefly is that of um, writing code. So this is something at, in my role as a research um, analyst, I work with researchers all the time and I'm often helping them write code. Um, I'm often writing code for them, uh, kind of in the data science sphere. And I found a lot of researchers are starting to see the benefit of generative AI through code. Um, so using generative AI to help understand so as the educator helping to understand code that they may have found online or that they've been given or that they're using and um, just trying to understand what's going on under the hood a little bit better, as well as being able to put in broken code and see what's going wrong and help helping with that troubleshooting and debugging process. And then of course, there's the ghost creator um, role where we can be generating documentation for code that we wrote, um, potentially generating code to do things like um, conduct a certain analysis in R or Python, um, maybe build a visualization with certain features. Um, you want to say that each of the scatter point or each of the points in a scatter plot, you want at an 80% opacity, something like that. Chat. Um, 
Oh yeah, so someone just messaged to ask if video and slides. So the presentation is being recorded. Slides will be put up online um, and emailed out to, I think they'll be emailed out to everybody afterwards. Um, yeah, Alex just posted, so thank you. Um, so yeah, no one has to worry about taking notes or figuring out where these links actually go to. Uh, okay, back to writing code. And of course, as, as with any code found on the internet, um, there is no guarantee that the code that generative AI provides you is going to be correct or that it's even gonna be safe to run. So as always, it's really important that as researchers, as just good citizens of the internet, we're validating and verifying what we find online as well. Um, on kind of the code and generative AI, I have a link here um, to a webinar that Marie uh, did a few weeks ago, about a month ago, on using GitHub Copilot um, as a way to improve efficiency and improve um, coding. So I suggest people interested check that out as well. And then just a few other kind of opportunities that we don't often think about as to where generative AI could kind of fit in the research pipeline. Um, or what some of the benefits might be for using generative AI. And I think the biggest one um, is reducing language barriers in a very English-centric um, space and a very English-centric field, uh, being able to reduce language barriers and have folks whose first language isn't English be able to publish. Um, and is that's only gonna be a good thing, um, or I shouldn't say only, but that has a lot of great potential. As well, things like identifying funding opportunities, searching for grants online, or as well, finding collaborators. Potentially, there's someone who's written uh, work in a particular space that you're interested in doing interdisciplinary collaboration with. Uh, Generative AI may be able to help with that. And then I'm not going to go through this slide, but I just collected a few articles and reports on some discipline-specific applications of Generative AI. So this will be the slides for anyone who's interested um, and looking at that in more detail. Okay, so as with as with anything, when we have a whole bunch of opportunities, often um, there's a trade-off of risk as well. And that is certainly acknowledged by the research community. Um, in the same survey that Nature had reported on back in the fall, um, they also asked researchers what they thought negative impacts of generative AI might be on research. And we can see that their significant portion of researchers do, or researchers surveyed, do identify or do see what some of these problems might be. So things like proliferating misinformation, um, bringing bias into literature search searches or writing, um, and might bring inaccuracies um, or mistakes into research texts. So I think it is worthwhile to think about what some of these concerns are um, and what some of these risks, kind of what the impact of those risks might be down the road. So we'll start by looking at some of the practical concerns or the more immediate risks of using generative AI in research. The first one, which I'm going to guess quite a few people here, perhaps everyone here already has heard about or things is the risk of inaccuracy or hallucinations. Um, the reality is, is that generative AI models can present uh, fic fictitious situations or fictitious information as fact. And the, you know, what these models have been trained to do is speak very well, very clearly, and be articulate. But what that often can mean is that they state things as fact in a way that makes us trust them, um, even though the information that they're providing is wholly inaccurate. Um, even when queried for things like, you know, what are your sources? Where did you get this information from? Um, sometimes Generative AI can come up with entirely fictional uh, citations and sources. There is a um, example, I can't say it's a good example, um, within BC court, uh, cases uh, recently where a lawyer had used a generative AI to write a briefing and uh, a multiple court cases or generative AI produced multiple uh, precedent setting court cases, which never existed. Um, 
And so you can imagine the ramifications of kind of blindly following and believing that the what you're getting from these models is accurate. And on this topic, there's also a really good paper. It's a couple years old now um, called, or it's on the danger of stochastic parrots. Um, it's linked here, but the idea is effectively that these models sound really good, but they don't actually understand what they're saying. Um, so much like a parrot, they 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 say things, um, they sound like they're speaking English, but they truly have no idea what they're saying. And it's more it's difficult for them to reason or impossible for them to actually reason about what they're what they're um what they're telling us. So for this reason, it's important to recognize that there's inaccuracy um in what generative AI is producing for us. The second big question or big risk, I think, is data privacy. So generally speaking, and this isn't the case for all models, but generally speaking, publicly available models like ChatGPT or Gemini are going to take the data that you input. So whatever you ask it to do, whatever you upload, whatever text prompts you give it, it's going to take that data, it's going to upload it to their servers, and then it's going to keep it on their servers um, to then use for model training and model improvement down the road. For certain things, we're probably fine with that. For example, my uh, prompt to ask ChatGPT to create a uh, image of like an art drawing of Cedar, a supercomputer, um, it can it can keep that prompt, and I'm totally fine with it. Um, however, there's of course other situations where it retaining where data being retained and used for model training can be quite concerning. Um, so. For this reason, I encourage you to consider whether there are laws, um, data licenses, non-disclosure agreements, uh, data contracts that you've signed and must follow um, for whatever you're inputting into, uh, into a generative AI tool or interface. As well, another question is um, whether you would be upset if some portion of your prompt were to be used in response to another user. So you can imagine if you've um, you know, come up with something, come up with a, you're, you're writing a research paper, you're really excited to publish it and to submit it. Um, would you, and you put your abstract in, if that abstract were to be given in some part or in whole to another user who asks for a query, um, is that going to be a concern to you? If so, you might want to consider not using, you might want to consider the potential privacy and confidentiality risks of using publicly available generative AI tools. That being said, um, you can always look at the terms of use and also some models and some specific like enterprise licenses of models do provide kind of a um, memoryless option where your data won't be saved and used for future training. So instead what ends up happening is the data that you input in gets uploaded to a cloud, run through the model to give you an answer, and then that data is deleted um, and not used, not saved. So that's something to look into if this is a concern for you. But of course, there are still some cases where even those kinds of models aren't going to work. For example, um, if you are limited to only storing data within Canada and uploading data to ChatGPT is going to go into the States, then that's something that you need to be aware of. And potentially, you'll be limited in whether you can actually use um, some of these tools. And then the final kind of immediate risk that I want to make sure everyone is aware of is that um, is that of mo model bias. Most of us understand that AI, machine learning models, um, and therefore generative AI also or kind of has bias or has the potential for bias. Um, and how these models are trained means that they effectively perpetuate or they're, they're going to echo or parrot whatever it is that they learn. Um, so they can blindly perpetuate biases that they learn from the internet, from large purposes of text. And, you know, the internet isn't always the kindest, most diverse, um, or really most just place. Um, so for that reason, these models can end up perpetuating those, those biases. Now, some models like ChatGPT, for example, are effectively coached. Um, before they go from that raw model to a public interface, they're coached to act in a certain way to hopefully minimize some of these harmful biases. So um, if you've used ChatGPT, you might rec you might see that it kind of has this very personal assistant. Um, it wants to help you. It you know 
has this personality in a, in a sense. Other systems also have personalities of their own because they've been coached in slightly different ways. I think Elon Musk's a generative AI tool, I think it's Grok or Grok or something like that, um, similarly was coached in a different way and has a very like Elon Musk type personality. It's a little abrasive. Um, so the, these have personalities because they've been coached, but of course that coaching also incorporates bias. So it's important to understand that whatever model you're using is going to have some implicit bias built into it. So in light of all of these risks that are associated with using generative AI, there's also some duties that, you know, as researchers, we should be holding ourselves and others accountable to. The first is a duty of verification. So when we're using generative AI tools, we need to make sure that we're verifying the accuracy and validity of anything output from these models. Um, that means that in we kind of have a duty that a human and particularly ourselves, if we're putting our name to it, um, that we're reviewing every output that's coming out of a generative AI tool before we choose to incorporate it into our own work as well. We need to be checking for unintentional plagiarism. As I mentioned, if we put something in to generative AI tool, it's used for training um, and then could be spat out down the road to a different user. Much the same can happen to us. Um, if we're asking for an abstract to be written, it's possible that what generative AI is going to do is it's going to pull together a whole bunch of different papers and come up with something that is unintentionally plagiarizing others' work. Um, so this is a duty that we have um, to verify what is coming out of ChatGPT or coming out of generative AI tools. The second duty is one of disclosure. So um, the best practice right now is to document and disclose any use of generative AI tools in every stage of the research process. Um, right now, um, the biggest place, and I'll talk about this in a moment, the biggest place where we need to disclose or where the best practice is to disclose is within um, writing. And if the if generative AI has been used for any of the like foundational stages of the research process, like hypothesis um, generation, data analysis, that kind of thing. And finally, there's a duty of discretion. So as researchers, we need to use our own critical thinking capabilities um, to decide whether or not we should be using generative AI for a particular task. We should not assume that generative AI is private, which means we should not be sharing confidential, sensitive, or proprietary information with generative AI tools, particularly public generative AI tools. As well, we should not assume that the output from generative AI is already in the public domain. So it's possible that the output that we get from generative AI is um, already under copyright or it contains someone else's IP. And then, kind of transitioning from some of the more practical everyday concerns to a few bigger picture concerns that we won't delve too much into, but I do think it's important to just have in the back of our brains as we start to think about how we might use generative AI and how generative AI might become or how it's gonna change and impact the work that we do as it becomes um, more widespread. So questions that we might wanna consider impacts of generative AI more generally, that we want to think about are things like, will researchers gravitate towards certain research, que research questions if generative AI becomes widely adopted? Um, there's some evidence that researchers in fields like social sciences are using generative AI tools as a stand-in for human interviewees. Um, of course, those uh, the questions that we can ask those generative AI tools are going to be different than questions that we can ask um, human interview participants. Um, so of course the questions, the research questions that we can ask and approach are going to be different um, in the, and could potentially skew if we're always focused on asking questions that generative AI can help with. The questions that we're going to ask could be skewed. Additionally, um, there's some evidence already that these tools are going to kind of it's going to light a fire and it's there's going to be a huge hyper productivity of um, researchers where um, new manuscripts, new research products are produced at a much higher rate. And there's a big question about how academia generally and research generally is going to deal with that this hyper productivity 
um, of researchers. For example, how do we deal with peer review? How do we um, deal with quantity versus quality? Um, and we really need to think about what our reward structures are um, for this kind of, or in this, in light of these potential uh, consequences. As well, how should, or how should, or how might mentorship and training change? If we're using a generative AI um, to, in the context of a research assistant or as a role of a research assistant, what does that mean for the research assistants that we would have hired? Or the research assistants that we have hired? Are we going to, do we have the ability to properly train them in the ethical use of generative AI in research? Um, do we not have the funding anymore to train research assistants and to have graduate students? Um, so there's a lot of questions there as well. And finally, um, I think this is, this is a big question for me is, will unique perspectives and voices be diluted through the use of generative AI tools? For example, if we say that all of these tools have their own kind of personalities and every single researcher on this call writes a paper and has asks um, Copilot and Microsoft Word to kind of clean it up and make it have a academic professional voice, does that mean that every paper is gonna have kind of that same um, underlying personality to those, uh, to, to the edits and to the revisions that get made? So before I jump into best practices, I will just pause briefly to see if there are any questions. Um, I see one from Perry in the chat, suggests using a modeling model system that produces citations of Bing. That's you do to verify factuality of output. Yes, so for sure using the other tools that we have at hand to actually go and find what the cite, like citations or factuality of generative AI output. Um, I think the biggest concern is less about the tool that you use to do that verification, but just about doing the verification uh, in the first place. So I think that's something that we can, um, if you don't do that, or if you read something over, yeah, that looks good. Um, it's easy to, to kind of give a thumbs up to a piece of text um, without actually following through and um, really critically evaluating it. So some best practices within the field. I've broken this up into two things. First, I'm gonna talk about some of the policies and guidelines and then um, some advice from kind of others in the field and practical on the ground advice. So um, policies and guidelines, current trends from funding agencies and publishers are generally in agreement, but of course there are some differences. Um, but in, in general, the trend does seem to be that um, grants and publications are allowed to use at least some amount of generative AI in, in their development with conditions. So grants have a uh, condition of disclosing how generative AI was used, as well as the condition of human owner oversight or um, authorship responsibility. So the PI or research team lead is ultimately responsible and has to take responsibility for anything that's submitted as part of a grant application, um, regardless of whether that was created by a generative AI tool or not. Similarly, most publishers are allowing generative AI to be used, provided it's how it's used is disclosed um, and there's human oversight. As well, they tend to limit um, the use of generative AI to specific purposes like um, you can use generative AI in writing as long as it's for improving clarity and um, style, not for generating first drafts. As well, in general, um, peer reviews are for grants or for publications generally are not allowing the use of generative AI. And some specifically say that inputting um, manuscripts that are under review into generative AI tools um, is completely banned, not even using it to create, but even just the input um, to summarize, for example. Uh, and the big reasons, you know, the two big reasons that are cited for why peer, um, why generative AI is banned during the peer review process is one for private, um, privacy and confidentiality. So not putting someone else's work into a generative AI tool without their permission. Um, so that's thing one. And the second um, reason for this is uh, publications or publishers at this point uh, 
are saying that we need to have human eyes and human expertise. And the reason why we have peer review is because of the expertise that reviewers have. And a journey of AI wouldn't be able to have that deep level of expertise in particular fields. So therefore we can't use a gender of AI in that, in those circumstances. Again, difference, there's differences that exist between publishers and funding agencies, but these are the general trends um, of what is allowed and what's not allowed. And because we're in Canada, I do think it's important to mention um, what Canadian policy is on this topic. And as of now, we are awaiting official guidance from the tri-agencies, um, but there was an ad hoc gender of AI panel of external experts struck last year, um, and they released a report with uh, specific advice um, that, that will be incorporated into the tri-agency policies on generative AI. And the two big points from this are that um, the committee or the panel urged against blanket bans on the use of generative AI in grant writing, um, instead focus on disclosure and having the applicant be ultimately responsible for the application's content. And then as well, they've advised against um, disallowing, they've advised to disallow uh, re reviewers from unsanctioned uses of generative AI, but have also said that a blanket um, ban is probably unrealistic and a little short-sighted. So we're still awaiting what this guidance will be, um, but it is it is on its way in theory. And then I won't go over this, but I've li linked to some of the um, policies from academic publishers um, for folks who might be interested. Okay, so jumping into advice from the field. Um, the first thing is when we're thinking about using generative AI in research, um, the first thing that we wanna make sure we're doing is that we're using the right model. Um, and this is the same as you know any kind of application of methods and research. We wanna make sure we're using the right method. Um, and in this case, we wanna make sure we're using the right model. Each model has its own kinds of trade-offs. Models, an example is a model like Claude from Anthroponic is really good at summarizing documents, but might be not so great at creating diagrams or um, writing code. Alternatively, uh, models like ChatGPT are really good at certain tasks and not others. So trade-offs exist. As well, um, in some cases, there have been models that have been built um, that are really good at working in particular tasks, in particular domains, or at the intersection of particular disciplines and tasks. So it's important to kind of do your research and figure out what model does make the most sense for your particular use case. Um, and there's this blog post, which came out yesterday um, on some of the comparisons between um, models. The, this, the fellow who has written this as well um, has a series of blog posts from the last year and a half um, that talk about some of those model comparisons and when to use a particular model over another. Of course, the field is rapidly changing so that advice is going to change as well. The second piece of advice from the field is to spend time um, and be thoughtful about the prompts that you use. Um, and that the tweaking and adjustment and editing of prompts, we tend to call prompt engineering. Um, so the biggest thing is garbage in, garbage out. We know this from uh, data analysis um, or other kinds of models or methods. If the data that we're putting in is garbage, we can't expect you know, a magically fantastic result on the other end. So in this case, if we put, um, if we're using kind of a lackluster prompt that's vague, um, doesn't ask anything in particular, we're not likely to get what we want at the other end. So for that reason, um, playing with generative AI tools outside of the context of work or research even um, does help a lot in kind of understanding the best ways to interrogate um, or prompt an AI. Um, but as well, there's frameworks that have that are out there that can be really helpful um, for developing prompts um, as a guide. So an example uh, framework format is the role task format, um, which is where you provide the role that you want the AI to act as, the task that you want it to complete, and then the format that you're hoping a result will come in. 
So an example of this could be something like acting as a scientific um, reviewer from the field of computer, computing science, uh, look through this introduction and identify five different points uh, or five different areas where it could improve list uh, these suggestions in bulleted form. And that's a way to kind of guide the AI in um, coming up with the best or coming up with a, with a result that's going to be meaningful and helpful for you. This is a nice table um, from a LinkedIn blog post um, that goes through six of these frameworks and provides some heuristics on when it can be helpful to use um, each, each framework. And then the final um, kind of advice from the field is to not do not implicitly trust generative AI. I'm sure you guys have picked this up from what I've been saying um, for the last half hour, but the idea here is that we shouldn't directly be using model output. Instead, think about asking for advice um, for the model to give you advice that then you can incorporate yourself. This is kind of by doing this, by having this approach, you're putting yourself, um, or you're putting a human in between the model's outputs and the research output that you're producing. Um, so it provides, so you're able to act as that verifier or validator. Again, this is kind of using a generative AI as a sounding board rather than as a ghost creator. And of course, um, the biggest thing to remember here is that you're responsible for anything that you put your name to, uh, and you need to do what you feel um, is right and what's going to make the most sense for you down the road um, and ensure that you're not using these tools in unethical um, or unresponsible ways. And then just a really quick conclusion, a couple of things to, to take away. Um, one, generative AI isn't always the right tool. Um, sometimes we try to force, you know, by changing our prompts and changing our task, we try to force um, a problem into, you know, square, full, round peg kind of deal. Um, but sometimes generative AI isn't what we want to use, and that's okay. Um, instead, when we're considering whether to use generative AI, we should be thinking about whether there are policies that are restricting, prohibiting a particular use of generative AI or submitting data to a generative AI, those kinds of things. Um, as well, we should weigh the risks and benefits to using generative AI for a particular purpose. It, sure, maybe time, maybe there are some time benefits, but if the risks are too long, that's not going to be worth it. As well, I think it's important to consider whether the work that we're trying to produce um, whether it's important that it makes use of our particular unique perspectives, expertise, or opinions. Um, because otherwise, there's a, I think there's a big question about whether you should be using Gen of AI or not. Uh, and then with that, I've got references here um, for folks to check out if they want. And otherwise, I will open it up to questions. <laughs>